Hi, I'm Oliver Connelli from the University of Cologne. When planning clinical trials with the Mycosis Study Group based in the US and with the European Confederation of Medical Mycology, what we figured out is that we are lacking definitions for breakthrough fungal infections. That is a problem clinically and in clinical trial design. So we sat down and over a couple of discussions and a good year of work came up with definitions and that is what I want to share with you today. Before I start with my presentation I'd like to share with you briefly my transparency declaration. There are many companies we work with, my group in Cologne and, and, and I personally and usually this is about clinical trial design. It's an international group now working on the breakthrough invasive fungal definitions and that is from Europe and from the US and from Australia as you can see on this slide and we do so on behalf of the Mycosis Study Group and the European Confederation of Medical Mycology. The methods that we applied are pretty straightforward. So we first searched the English language literature, then uh, extracted definitions that had been used in either patients with a hematological malignancy or with solid organ transplant, abbreviated it SOT on this slide, or other clinical situations, for example, intensive care uh, unit patients. And then we drafted definitions and we circulated that draft to the members of both organizations, addressed comments and suggestions that came in, and then circulated the updated draft for approval. There is only one way to be a treatment success but there are actually five different ways to fail treatment of an invasive fungal infection. And when we wanted to define only breakthrough, we had to define all of these uh, clinical settings first. Number one is persistence of fungal infection. Number two is refractoriness of a disease. Number three is a relapse. Number four is a breakthrough invasive fungal infection during prophylaxis and empiric treatment. And number five is a breakthrough IFI, as we abbreviated, during preemptive treatment or targeted treatment. So let me lead you through all five of these scenarios. When we deal with invasive fungal infection and specifically breakthrough, we need to know how a treatment success looks like. And I um, did that following sketch. So of course, this is following a patient over time and we want to describe disease activity over the time course. This is a disease, in this case invasive fungal infection, and as soon as that disease is being diagnosed, you start treatment, this broad block. And then if treatment is successful, disease activity will go down to zero, and that's it. And the patient is fine, and it's the end of the story. But now there are these five ways to fail. So let's move back. This is disease activity. You start treatment, but now it does not work, but you do have persistent fungal infection. So the fungal disease is pretty much uninfluenced by the treatment. That's one way certainly to fail. There's another one. That is, you start your treatment, but actually there is no effect and the disease even uh, gets broader and broader in a patient so it might uh, start to disseminate or lung infiltrates are growing and growing despite treatment. So that is what we call refractory invasive fungal infection. Number three is the relapse of invasive fungal infection. So at first, as you see, everything looks fine and it looks like that was a successful treatment. But now the moment where you stop treatment, the fungal growth starts again and that is that red line and you have to diagnose the fungal infection again and treat it again and it's certainly something that you don't want to see in your patients because this carries a very high likelihood of dying. Number four, that's breakthrough infection during prophylaxis or empiric treatment. 
If your patient is on prophylaxis or on empiric treatment, that means that there is antifungal exposure before you diagnose a fungal infection, because that is what you want to prevent. But if it doesn't work, if it's another way of failing, way number four of failing actually, that is what happens. Another red line here, and that's the activity of your invasive fungal infection. Of course, you would start a treatment of that breakthrough invasive fungal infection, and hopefully that is successful, but since uh, today's talk only deals with the definition of breakthrough and not practically with the definition of success, that is all we look at if it comes to uh, what is depicted on that slide. And there is one fifth way left where we might fail with treatment, and that is a fungal infection that starts, you diagnose it early, for example, because some biomarker gets positive, that could be a blood sample and you find galactomannan in there, and you would immediately start such preemptive treatment. And actually, if you even would have a biopsy and proven fungal infection, and that would mean that your treatment here is a targeted treatment, but still, that's the pretty much this very similar situation to preemptive treatment. And with either one, you might be successful. If so, then that would be the further course of that fungal infection. And you might have a breakthrough though after that, and that means that the patient is still receiving antifungal, either preemptively or as a targeted treatment. But as you see here, the next fungal infection or the same pathogen starts another round of disease again. You would start and answer that with a treatment of the breakthrough fungal infection, of course. So that is the six scenarios. Number one was the scenario of success, and then there are five scenarios of failure, and some of them actually really meaning breakthrough fungal infection. In a nutshell, the definition of breakthrough IFI is, has only two components. It's any invasive fungal infection occurring during exposure to an antifungal drug. That's number one. Number two is it includes pathogens that are outside of the spectrum of activity of that antifungal that we use in the patient. Breakthrough IFI's conclusions and outlook. We think that we were really the first to propose consensus definitions for that topic. And indeed, we hope that it will support the design of future clinical trials and of epidemiological research. We hope that the use of the definitions will increase comparability of clinical trial results. And please refer to the full paper for all the details, for example, the predisposing factors that need to be taken into account if you plan such a study, and of course the pharmacokinetic parameters of the individual drugs. And in that paper you will find a table of these parameters for all drugs out there, including the ones that we will have in the near future. So, thank you very much, hope you found it useful, and this is ID in Motion.